And we are live. It is 5 p.m. Pacific time, uh, Friday, January, uh, whatever the hell the date is today, January 22nd, 2021. All righty. So we're continuing our series on um, peated Highland single malt scotch whiskeys. Tonight we're going to be looking at Oban, not Oban, or Oban, but Oban. It's kind of like open. Oops. Uh, it's supposed to be supposed to like like open the door, except it's open with a B rather than a P. Say hello to a few people who have already tuned in. Michael Bennett, it's his 60th birthday, so here you go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mike Bennett. Happy birthday to you and he's drinking an open 14 and he's got a ben reick uh single cast peated px finish i have a glenn mori uh px um peated cask which i'll be getting back into later on during this series donna pass whiskey thank you very much for uh tuning in michael c 2019 uh it looks like i got the usual uh, gang here uh it says uh wow thanks i love your singing voice uh you're welcome I uh, kind of grew up in a singing family, learned to listen to your own voice and kind of control it, uh, singing in church. A lot of people learn singing in church. So I was in an, an acap- a church where we sing a cappella, a cappella hymns. So you're not being drowned out by or an organ or a praise band or something like that. And so you, you have to really, really <coughs> excuse me, learn to listen and control your voice. All righty. So tonight I'm drinking the uh, Oban um, Distiller's Edition. Bottom 2016, distilled in 2001. However, I'm going to go real easy tonight because yesterday I went to the ER. I went to the emergency room yesterday, and uh, I've got three kidney stones. A lot, a lot. I've been in this. I've had this pain of kidney stones, and I've had them before. I've had I've had kidney stones since like 2008, off and on, you know, and, and you know, and once, you, once you know them, you really know them. Very, 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 very painful. Sometimes they'll pass on their own. A few times I've gone into the ER, had to go in the emergency room, and they put they practically knock you out with some really, really good drugs. So I couldn't stand anymore. Went to the ER yesterday. I got a CAT scan, got an X-ray. I might have spent too much time talking about this. And I got three kidney stones. Thankfully, they're under five milligrams. Five milligrams, and you can't pass it because they're too big. So they give me really good uh, uh, painkiller drugs. And they give me uh, some stuff to make things flow. Anyway, yeah, it's it's no fun. So I can be just fine, feeling just fine. And all of a sudden, ooh, that, that hurt. You know, it's like that. It's like you're sitting there talking. Like, it seems particularly if I stand up, move, whatever. Anyway, so um, kin zones are no fun. All right, enough of that. Uh, Jimmy Jazz, thank you much for uh, tuning in. Uh, Dave, Chris Hope, thanks for uh, tuning in. No Man's Van, thank you much for... Uh, uh, t- uh, tuning in. So my father sang. My father was a singer, and one of my older brothers was a voice major uh, in college. Uh, s- sings opera as well, and uh, I like singing. I sing all the time. Singing for me, um, I'm always kind of going around. Do 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 You know, it, it. If you're doing something monotonous, right? Something that's consuming, or whatever. I use it to sort of pass time. I use to relieve stress if I'm if I'm walking around at work or whatever and I'm feeling you, you can hear me humming and singing and I don't even know. Here's a funny thing. I'll tell you a funny story. You don't I don't even sometimes I don't even know I'm doing it. So when I was studying for the certified small exam, and the most challenging part for me was the service exam because I'd never worked in a restaurant. Um, you know, the theory part, yeah, there's a gazillion things you gotta memorize, blind tasting. Uh, I did really, really well on, but the service part is where you're doing like a mock restaurant and you're having to do champagne service. And at the same time you're doing champagne service, you have to answer questions about, uh, about wines. You might get, I actually got a question about uh, peated whiskeys and, uh, food and wine pairing. So, and you're in front of a master sommelier. That's the most stressful part. So I studied for 18 weeks with three master sommeliers. Uh, Eric and Trenkin, Alan Murray, and uh, Ian Cobble. If you ever seen the movie Psalm, uh, in fact, I'm wearing one of the shirts. Psalm, 
And Ian Cobble is the blonde haired guy at the beginning of the movie. I studied with him for 18 weeks. It was like uh, three hours a night, uh, three nights, three to four hours, three nights a week. Anyway, so before we had the actual exam for the quartermaster Maliers, right, did some uh, practice tests. And so I'm doing a practice test with Eric and Trinkin. And I previously hadn't been doing too well uh, during the service exam. So one night, this is like just before the exam, we do a press exam. And then they see, they see then you do an evaluation. And he says, wow, you did really, really well. Huge improvement. You did really, really well. But one thing. I was like, what? He says, don't sing when you're doing mise en place. I was like, singing? Mise en place is where you have like this table and you're doing your setup of all your stuff. And then you you know you do the cork and all that stuff. I had no idea I was doing it. And I was like, so what did I sing? He goes, I don't know. But whatever it was, you were singing while you were doing it. Now, I wasn't singing because I had a jolly good time or because I was trying to serenade him. It's just, it was my dealing, we dealing with stress of doing everything. So I was singing something and I wasn't even aware of it, which is kind of fun. Some people go, oh, Eric, you must be so happy because I hear you singing. Not necessarily, maybe just my way of uh, dealing with stress. Scotch Comic, thank you much for tuning in. Michael Hassar, thank you much for tuning in. And I am smart, thank you much for tuning in. So I like singing. Um, all righty. So we're going to get into Oban. Uh, I've been to the distillery, but I didn't have a chance to do a tour. So let me bring something up real quick. Um, here is a map. All right. So um, I've been to Scotland twice. The first time um, I part of the trip to Scotland was with a tour group. We met up in Edinburgh. You can see up to the lower right there, big red letters. And uh, there were probably, I don't know, eight to 10 of us or so on a tour van. Really great uh, tour guide driver. Really, really knowledgeable, really uh, enthusiastic. So we drove from Edinburgh. We stopped at Deanston Distillery. You can see it there on the map. And then made our way up to Oban. Off to, you see off there to the left, Oban. And then we came down the coast and then caught a ferry and then took it over to Isla. Isla is one of the islands off to the left-hand side, lower left-hand side, if you're looking there on the map. So that was sort of the route that we took uh, to get there. So let me then show you a map where I'm going to give you a little bit of a background to... Oops, I just did something I didn't want to do. Hold on. Give me a second here. All right. So I went to Oban, but... We only stopped at Oban to eat lunch. We weren't planning, it, it wasn't part of the doing a tour. So some people were, um, they'd go get lunch and stuff like that. So Oban Distillery is sort of like downtown, if you want to call it that, uh, Oban, the town of Oban. And the, uh, the docks are right there, the port is right there. So they have absolutely no space to move. They can't expand because they're kind of wedged in there. If you go on Google uh, Earth, you can look it up and you can see they're kind of like in a little cul-de-sac off the main road. So the main road that comes down into the town of Oban, and then you hang a left and there's like a little cul-de-sac and they're right there. So it's they're kind of, they can't expand, they can't get any bigger, and which limits their uh, production. And I think, uh, Jack White, thank you much for uh, tuning in. Thank you very much. By the way, I've been seeing uh, Jack has been donating bottles to uh, uh, the Whiskey Vault. Uh, so I, I watch the Whiskey Vault every day and then try whenever they uh, post a video. Anyway, say, so, hey, hey, Eric, I'm tuning in a few minutes late, uh, but I finally made it. Cool, cool. Thank you much for tuning in. You're not late. You're never late. This isn't church where you're, or you're not punching the clock coming into work. Um, so if you're watching on the replay, you're watching live, I, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Slinger. Hey, how you doing, man? So Mark Slinger, we met at Glen Moray. If I recall correctly, uh, up, so he works. Uh, he's in Northern Scotland, and we met up at Glen, uh, Glen Murray. Destin, thank you much for uh, tuning in, man. So I thought, you know, why run around to? There's some restaurants and stuff there. Why run around to a restaurant and grab a sandwich or sit there and grab a, a sandwich? Why not use the time to go visit the distillery, do a tasting? And then just grab a sandwich, you know, at a sandwich shop or something or whatever they got there and eat it on the bus. I'm not doing the driving. 
So that's what I did. I went and took, I did a, a little visit there, and I'll, I'll show you a little vi video here real quick. Mike Houser says, I always wanted to see Jack White take on Jack Black in a guitar battle. Yeah, yeah, right. Anyway, all right, so I'm going to show you a little video clip. You'll get a little bit of a, a, a viewing of my experience of visiting the distillery. All right, here we go. After visiting Deanston, the Scottish Roots tour bus continued on Highway A816 en route to Kenna Craig Port, where we would meet the ferry that would take us to Isla in the late afternoon. We then stopped at the town of Oban for an hour lunch, just long enough to visit the Oban distillery and briefly visit the tasting room, but not do a tour. And while sampling a few drams of whiskey, you can learn a little bit about the town of Oban and the distillery in the tasting room. Oban Distillery is located on Scotland's west coast port town of Oban. In 1794, before the town of Oban was built in the surrounding harbor, the distillery was built by the brothers John and Hugh Stevenson, who operated it until 1866 when it was bought by Peter Kernstie. In 1883, it was then acquired by Walter Higgin and rebuilt. In 1898, Alexander Edward, who also owned Altmore Distillery, purchased the distillery from Higgin. In its first year of operation, it suffered major losses when one of their buyers, a major blending company, Pattisons of Leith, went out of business. In 1923, Oban was sold to Dewars and joined Distillers Company with that company in 1925. It then ceased operating from 1931 to 1937 and again from 1969 to 1972 when a new still house was built, and in 1989 a new visitor center was added. Today, Oban Distillery is owned by Diageo. Oban Distillery is primarily known for its 14 euro malt, which is marketed as part of Diageo's classic malt selection range, launched in 1988. There is also an 18 year old limited edition and a rare 32 year old edition. In December 2014, Oban introduced a non-age statement bottling called Oban Little Bay. Alrighty. Um, da -da -da -da. So, uh, I actually brought this one home from the distillery. When I visit distilleries, I'm looking for special editions that aren't widely available. So this is called the Distiller's Edition, but it's not a distillery exclusive. There was a young guy, because you can, I think I think that drinking age is 19 there. And so you get very young people there. And when I said, I want a distiller's distillery exclusive, I think he mistakenly thought a distiller's edition. So I'd actually tasted two different uh, dist uh, distiller's editions, plus a distillery exclusive. I did, and somehow in my head, I didn't know the distillery editions weren't distillers exclusive. So the distillers editions if you go online. Uh, they're basically vintage dated. If you do the math on when it was uh, distilled and when it was bottled, that tells you how how old it is. So basically, this is a fourteen year old. Um, this is not the most uh, recent release, but it is still widely uh, available. Hey, Christopher Moore, thank you much for uh, tuning in. He says, "Is there such a thing as a?" Haggis Happy Meal in Scotland. That's a good question. With a little toy. You know, it was some, some little uh, toy to come on. Beth Higgins, thank you much for tuning in. Said, I had an uh, Open 18 in my hands today and could not decide. So I actually have the Open 18 right here. Um, I've already tasted it. I've already opened up, and my review will be coming uh, shortly. So basically what I'm doing, I'm getting back into uh, uh, um, the, the Distiller's Edition. The Distiller's Edition. Well, they're really nice. So one of the things in, 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 in looking at Highland peated whiskeys is you're kind of looking for what's the difference between, well, at least one I'm looking for, what's the difference between particularly Isla and Highland, the, the peat difference. And this one it has, I would say, more saltiness and more oceanic influence than the other Highland peated whiskeys. And what is obvious is that it is, you know, the places right next to the sea, but where are they aged? Where are the warehouses? I don't know. That place is so small. 
I seriously, seriously doubt they're aging their whiskeys there. And it's owned, but it's owned by Diageo. But I don't know if you ever noticed this, but almost all Diageo bottles have the basic same shape. The, the head here is supposed to look somewhat like the top of a still. It kind of uh, bulges out right here. It's common for stills to have a, a, a reflex bulge so that at, pretend this is the head of a still so that as the spirit is going up, it hits that bulge, makes it a little bit more challenging for it to continue to go up. And so it drops back down into the still. So it's a re sort of like a reflex uh, little bulge there. So, <coughs> excuse me. So it's a common sort of look at, at Diageo bottles. Any non-Diageo open alternatives? Not that I know of. I think you'd have to go back in time quite a bit. Uh, to uh, find them. James Morgan, thank you very much for tuning in. He says, evening, Eric, from uh, Lockdown, London. Yeah, I hear. Yeah, and I, I think we're going to be having some lockdowns uh, here in the United States uh, more as well. They think it's going to cure anything. It isn't doing jack diddly, other than destroying our economy. Sorry, it isn't. In fact, the World Health Organization said during the lockdown, I know I shouldn't be talking about this topic, during the lockdown, it's having economic uh, impact on us, which then has a domino effect around the world. And the, the poor nations, the people are dying because of it, uh, because of the economic impact downflow to poor countries. I know I shouldn't be talking about this. This, this is not time to talk about that stuff. I'm just telling reality. You know, sorry. All righty. So really, really, really nice whiskey. I've got it down to about there. So as you may notice, if you've been following my channel, I'm basically, I'm posting seven days a week. I do uh, five short videos, two regular videos that could be 10, 15 minutes long, and I'm doing a live, a live stream. Something coming up in the month of February, I've been doing just sort of odds and ends. I'm sort of experimenting with shorts. The purpose of a short video, shorts are a new format created by YouTube in order to compete with TikTok. They're meant to be uh, watched vertically like this, so they're meant to so that if you watch one of my short videos like this, it'll fill the whole screen. So if you're watching my shorts and you have a smartphone, watch them like this, not like this, not but like this, and then the the, the video will fill the whole screen. Um, so I've been sort of experimenting it. You know, how much can you cram into into uh, one minute? You know, and, and it's it creatively, it's easier to write a hundred page paper and say a lot and say everything you want to say. Try saying everything you want to say about a topic on one page. Writing, try to be that concise and to the point is really, really challenging. Very, very similar with the videos is try to uh, do it in one minute. All right. So in February, I will be doing uh, all returns to whiskeys for the month of February, mostly bottles that have been open for two years or more. The purpose of doing that is, one of the most common questions that is asked is, does whiskey go bad? In other words, after having it open for a long period of time, does whiskey go bad? Uh, it can. It can. depends on how much you keep pulling on the opening uh, the cork. But one of the advantages of whiskeys is over wines is I can open a, a bottle of whiskey, enjoy it, put it on a shelf, and then share it with you later, and, we, and I can share a whiskey with you. You can't do it with a wine. Once you open a bottle of wine, within a few days, you need to consume it. So it's one of the things I like about whiskey is it's more shareable. You can return to it. I can be, be tasting a whiskey and I think, you know, this kind of reminds me of this. Hey, I'm going to compare it with this. You grab a bottle, pour two, and then you kind of do a side-by-side -side or comparison. or to. Re so I, I'm sort of in February going to be uh, refreshing my memory of certain whiskeys, but also testing to see, hey, these bottles have been done for two years. How are they doing? If any of them gone flat or anything like that or – uh, become stale or anything like that, I'll, I'll make a comment in the video. So I'm going to be doing that uh, as well. So as well as, you know, just returning some whiskeys and 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 enjoying the, the, the inventory that I got here. All right. So my next series after uh, this Highland Peated, Peated Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey Series, I'm going to be doing a series on... Um, so I got to block someone here. Yep. So anyway, just got a uh, Dustin. Anyway, so, uh, Dustin, do me a favor, keep an eye out for stuff like that. Uh, some douchebag just showed up. Um. 
So, anyway, I'm gonna so I'm gonna be doing a series on Sherry Sherry Cast Finished Whiskeys. Friday nights, Friday nights will become like a class. It'll be a Friday night class talking about Sherry Sherry and Sherry Cast Whiskeys, and then uh, the rest of the week should be um, um, doing my regular reviews. So. The reason I'm saying this is because this would actually be a really, really, really good bottle for that series. So let me get, show you my notes on this particular whiskey. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. All right. So distilled in 2001, bottled in 2016. They call it a 14-year-old. Aged in Montilla Fino Sherry Cask Finish. The word sherry really shouldn't be on there. Uh, sherry or Jerez is a, a DO or a uh, designated origin. It's a protected region. So you actually can't call Montilla. You can't call it a sherry, even if it's exact taste, exactly the same thing. So it's a protect, protected region. It's bottled at 43% alcohol by volume. And if you can find it, it goes for anywhere between $100 and $140. However, when I bought this uh, a couple years ago, I think I paid like $83. So, you know, tariffs and everything else, it's gone up just a, a little bit. <laughs> Beth Higgins says he was probably a vodka rep. I don't know. It, that doesn't happen very often. So whatever. Steve Crabtree. Hey, thanks for uh, tuning in, man. So really, really looking forward to getting into that. I'll actually have some bottles of sherry and uh, we'll go very, 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 very deep in, in talking about sherry. And do a share cast whiskey. Looking forward to getting into that. So uh, let me bring up a map. So this is actually from the Montilla uh, Morales uh, region. So here's a map. So if you look at the sort of in the somewhat in the middle, and it's that slight purple area right there, that's the Jerez region. That's that is the and then you have um, you have the uh, 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 Sherry Triangle right there. So if you look at the right. You look over to the right and that, that dark red, that's the Montilla Morales um, region. So that's two towns. So the uh, uh, Montilla region, and there's two, two main towns in there. And that's where this is from. So what is the difference between Sherry and uh, Montilla Fino? So uh, that region has the same classifications for wines as does Sherry. Uh, so Fino... Uh, um, Oloroso, Amantillado, Pela Cantado, and Pedro Jimenez. However, climate-wise, it's further inland. It has much more drastic uh, diurnal range. Um, it, it gets hotter and it gets colder. It's further away from the from the ocean. And in terms of like the dominant grapes, the the Sher the Jerez region or Sherry region, the dominant grape there is Palomino, the primary grape used the grape for use for making uh, Fino, Oloroso, Amantillado. Uh, Pelo Cantado is um, the Palomino grape. Pedro Jimenez is made from Pedro Jimenez. It's the uh, production method that makes the difference between the, the, the different wines. So same thing over in uh, um, the Morales area. However, the dominant grape over there is actually Pedro Jimenez. So a lot of PX, a lot of PX is actually come from there and not from Sherry. Is actually coming from there. They have the same soils, which is Abarisa soil. It's like this white, chalky-looking soil. It almost looks like snow if you look at a picture of the vineyards. So essentially, essentially, it's the same thing as a Fino Sherry, except the climatic impact is going to be a little bit uh, different. It's a little bit warmer. Uh, it's going to – they get – so warmer, uh, more sugar, right? The ripeness of the grapes – so they get to the 15% alcohol by volume very, 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 very e easily. The result is the whisk, the wines tend to have a little bit more body. They tend to be a little bit uh, uh, sweeter. And there's this film called floor that is formed. And that tends to be a little bit thinner on, I know I'm giving you a wine lesson, I'm talking about whiskeys, but give me the background as to well, what this is made of. So essentially this is a sherry cast finish in terms of what you think of what the style is but uh, it's a different region uh, with different climate and so on and so forth. Donner Pass says, uh, my PX Sherry um, mini barrel project turned out great. Oh, cool. After 58 days of mini barrel, 
I put the sherry back in the bottles, and my wife has been enjoying it. Very, very, very sweet. Peter Jimenez is very, very thick. It's almost like a syrup. It can be almost like a syrup, really, really thick. So it's really easy to overdo it uh, in terms of uh, aging sherries and stuff like that. Oh, hey, we got another, uh, we got another uh, donation here from Plains Crafter. Thank you very much for uh, the 10 bucks. I need a bell or some kind of thing to go. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Is Peter Jimenez Sherry fortified or uh, a fortified wine or uh, grape juice? Mm -mm 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 um, they do have a, a neutral grain, a neutral spirit added to it. I'm more familiar with the other sherries than I am in terms of the production process for Pedro Jimenez. Wow, I'm getting all these super chats. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for tuning in. Love the channel and live classes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, maybe I can, I can sing. Thank you for the money. I don't know. I'll have to come up with some, something like I'll come up with an idea or something like that. All right. <laughs> Two glens. There we go. I need another glen. There you go. Teacher says, every time a Glen Cairn rings, an angel gets its wings. There you go. Scott's down under. Thank you much for uh, tuning in, man. All right. So. Da, 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 da. Did that. We did that. We did that. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, the whiskey in itself. Um, typically, I get from Sherry. The telltale signs is those dried fig dates and raisin nuts. However, this is, it's got a lot more of a honeyed character. It's not as dark uh, in terms of the dried fruit character. It has more of a golden raisin character, less sultanas, a little more honeyed. Starts off sweet in the front, gets a little bit dry towards the back end in the fin to finish, like medium bodied. The saltiness really kicks in, I would say, towards uh, the mid palate. Really, really, really nice. The peat is really, really interesting. It's well integrated, and I'm not sure if it's me or if it's the whiskey. If you have whiskey, you know, peated peat, peat, and you're drinking a lot of peated whiskey, I think uh, I've heard Roy say this, is sort of, you start to become not quite immune, but like the, you don't sense the peat as much because you've been uh, tasting it so much. Because I've been in so much peated whiskeys, it seems the, the, the smoke in the peat is much more mild. Um, one of the things is the, the way the smoke in the peat is coming from, it's not coming across as chocolate. I... Don't get me wrong. I like it, but I like chocolate notes. I like chocolate notes in, in, in cherry cast whiskeys. I like savory notes in cherry cast whiskeys. This seems to be mostly on the sweet side, almost like, uh, it's funny because I had some earlier today, almost like a baklava where you get the honey character. There is that little of a, a bit of a dried note. There's a little bit of a nutty note, which again, reminds you of baklava if you've never had uh, baklava. Um. So it's starting off sweet and ending up dry. Now that dry character, the nutty character, that is a reflective of the actually aging process of sherry itself. So if you ever have pheno, in terms of color wise, pheno itself is like a, a like a light pale golden color, and really really good phenos up front. You get more apples and pears, and then when you get towards the back. Uh, you get more of the the uh, yeasty character and a sort of a, a dusty almond or almond, as my dad used to say, uh, on the on the back end, and that is from the sort of uh, biological and oxidative nature of the aging process of, of sherry. Now, what that film does, and I'll get more into this when I do a class on sherry, is it, it protects a uh, protects the sherry from going over the top and becoming overly oxidized. There is oxi It is a 
oxidative aged wine, but it's like sort of controlled and mitigated. So it maintains its fruit forward character on the, particularly on the front of the palate uh, by being protected by this floor uh, yeast film that co covers on the top. If you didn't have that, all you would have is the dry uh, almond character and you would lose a lot of fruitiness. Now, I know a lot of people who don't like, hey, taste and sensibility. Wow, people are dropping $10 here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, taste and sensibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Nicholas, thank you very much. Wow, five bucks. I'm surprised. Thank you very much. So if you've never had so and and I'll get again, I'm sort of getting ahead of the up, up, upcoming class. If you've never had sherry, they can take a little getting used to, but because sherries aren't super popular you can get high quality price ratio sherries and sherry doesn't go bad. You know, it's not like a normal table wine, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, uh, Pinot Noir, where you open a bottle and, and you know, with a pull of cork in a couple of days, you know, you kind of need to finish it. Sherry will last a real long time. Pedro Jimenez uh, will last a really, really, really long time. In fact, I have, I don't think where I put it. Oh, I have right here. Oh no, that's a port. Um, I've got a sherry around here somewhere. Oh, here we go. There we go. So here's a sherry right here. This is um, Venom Optimum Rare Symptom, Pedro Jimenez. And this has been opened. I opened this. It's probably, it's kind of, you can't hard to see it gets real dark. It's probably about right there. Um, it is still good. Uh, it's, it's probably been open for several years. If I were to pour some right now, I'm not going to do it because it's so sweet. It would just dominate the palate. It is still fresh. It doesn't go bad uh, right away. Um, port port wines, because it's a fortified wine, and sherry uh, wines will we'll both do that. So, again, I'll get more into that when we get into uh, talking about sherry cast. But on the palate, when, you taste, when you're tasting a whiskey, one of the things I, I like to do is, okay, why does this taste like this? Why does that taste like that? Where does this flavor come from, right? Trying to understand whiskey and where these different characteristics come from. Some notes, usually most of your fruity notes are coming from fermentation, right? And depending on how you do your fermentation, what kind of and different kinds of yeast can bring about different fruity esters off of a fermentation. So a lot of your fruity characters are coming from, from that. Your a lot of your spice, spice can come from a number of different places. It can come from, um, uh, it can come from the fermentation. It can, particularly say if you're using rye, obviously, it can come from the cast. A lot of your baking spices, uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, cl uh, clove can come from that. Uh, we were talking about this last week, talking about how Talisker has that distinctive uh, peppery note. And I'm still looking at, someone did put a really, really good comment on that video talking about uh, the construction of, uh, the stills that, uh, oh, no, no, it was in the, the Facebook group, in the Eric Waite Facebook group. If you have a Facebook account, you haven't joined the Eric Waite Facebook group, we got over 500 members. We got like 550 members uh, in the Facebook group. You want to check that out. It doesn't cost anything, obviously. Um, I Sometimes I'll post videos on there, you know, updates or behind the scenes kind of stuff. A lot of it is just obviously posting my links and stuff like that, but I try to update information in there. Um, so if you have a Facebook account, you want to check that out. I think I got a link to it down below in the description down below. But in trying to sort of retro engineer whiskey and being a whiskey geek, beyond just enjoying it, why does that taste like that? Um, learning the distinctive characteristics of sherry, how it's made, why sherries taste the way they do, and then be able to figure out from uh, the whiskey what's coming from the sherry casks and that sort of it's almost like a nutty almond character that shows up uh, in, on the back end of that and how why it goes dry and doesn't remain sweet as it did up, up front that is a distinctive note of the slight sort of oxidative uh nature of the taste of sherry's all right been talking a lot gotta take a sip i'm gonna drink a little bit of water i've, I've been trying to stay dehydrated with the uh, when I went into the one one of the ER yesterday, they put I got holes all over me. I got they put hole in here. They put a hole in here. They put a hole in here. 
put a hole in there. They put IVs in me all over the place and doing blood tests and all this kind of stuff. They said I was dehydrated. I drink water all the time. I'm, I'm constantly drinking water, so I, I but I also drink coffee and stuff, so I don't know what's up with that. Uh, Dustin says, all wines are no more the same than whiskeys. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but they bring similar notes to whiskey, but not the same. Right. So, the, so that dusty almond drying effect on the back end is coming from uh, sherry cask. Obviously, the dried black fruit notes, fig, dates, raisins are really, really common. So the challenge then in terms of retro, uh, retro engineering whiskeys and wines is what's, what's a different impact of a port cask versus um, um, a sherry cask? Because they both can have sort of that raisin character, you know, the dried black fruit. But I find port would typically more have some blackberry, blackberry jam, black preserves character. And that sort of dusty almond drying effect on the back end, I don't get that from port cast. Uh, but I do uh, get that from sherry. All right, take another sip. Hmm. No. One of the things the drying effect does when it sort of dries out, I think it makes you want to sip even more because you you had that sort of unctuous sweet character. Now it's going into dry. I think it has a tendency to make you want to go back. It's kind of like when you're at a bar and they had the little dish with the nuts in it or whatever they got in, you know, at a, at a bar. So you want to keep drinking beer more uh, because you're you're because of the saltiness is like that. Same sort of effect from the sherry cast. It makes you want to go back. To the uh, uh, to to the whiskey again, really really nice whiskey. I would say um, the difference between this and a lot of other sherry cask, it's got more of that honeyed note than a lot of sherry casks do. It's not as dark sherry notes. Dark. It's a little bit lighter in, in character. It does have a little bit more of a like a, almost like a like a peach. A gold fruit character to it, and then that saltiness is probably coming from who knows come come from uh, the coast. So really, really nice whiskey. Uh, I think eighty three dollars was a really, really good buy. If uh, obviously later edition, if you're going over a hundred dollars, if you're going over a hundred dollars, I think that would be a challenge. I because I think there are still a lot of other great sherry cask whiskeys. Uh, for under hundred dollars, that I would like just as well. Uh, score wise, what would I give us give us a score? I like the development. There's nothing. I would say the main thing is there's nothing that necessarily wows me that really makes it stand out as super ultra unique from everything else. But still, it's really well made, well crafted whiskey. Um, I wish. Well, it's probably got coloring in it. It's probably been. Fil it's probably chill filtered. Because uh, it didn't say otherwise here, um, so I, I don't necessarily let that affect my perception of a point score. But I'd give a real high eighties. I, I would say a real high eighties, like going around eighty. Really, really uh, nice, nice, nice whiskey. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Going to be reviewing the 18. The review should come out on uh, Sunday. So I don't want to sort of uh, give any spoilers, but I would say the 18 year old, if you haven't had the 18 year old, um, it has a much bigger punch of smoke and peat. When you think of people who are peat heads and you really want to get into something, uh, you know, uh, more in depth peat, the 18 is really getting you in, in that direction. If someone wants to be sort of um, introduced to Pete, they don't like a smack upside the head. They don't like a, a you know major in, in your face sort of Pete character. I think this is really well because uh, the Pete or and the smoke is really well integra integrated, and it's not sort of a standalone element, you know. So a lot of say island whiskeys, the the Pete can almost seem like a standalone element. Um, think of a cake with layers. You got your frosting. And then you have the uh, you have the cake part, and you know, and then you have, uh, then you have th thin layer. Maybe it's holding you know layers of cake together. So that frosting, when you bite in it, it's sort of on top and not well integrated. 
this doesn't have sort of that standalone smoky character. It's really, really uh, uh, well, well integrated into it, which depending on what you like and what you don't like, maybe actually what, what you're looking for. And if you want to introduce someone to Pete or you want something that has, it, it kind of has a savory note, but the sweetness is, there's so much sweetness there. Um, the savory note, if it's if you want to describe something as savory, it's much more of a minor character than uh, than the, the sweetness really sort of uh, driving the bus. Jacob Bates, thank you much for tuning in and thank you for uh, imparting your wine knowledge. Mm. I kind of wonder what. Um, yeah, so Dustin says I bet Oban is more on five to ten ppm. It's funny because I was thinking twelve. It's funny I was just thinking twelve. I think the ppm level, because I think uh, the Talisker um, runs like around twelve to fifteen ppm. So I think it's probably on the lower end there. But you're in the ballpark. And as I've said before, um, it's not what your ppm at just at when you're um, peating the barley. It's what is maintained after distillation and, and maturation. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're in the you're in that ballpark. So it makes its presence known, but it's much more of an accent rather than really sort of driving the bus, as do a lot of Isla-painted whiskeys. James Morgan says, "Cheers, mate. Uh, you are a step above the average reviewer. I appreciate the compliments. I find every reviewer has a different skill set, has a different gifts." Has different uh, um, abilities, has different backgrounds and angles, and I appreciate all of them. Right, not only in terms of providing uh, inf information, but in terms of delivery, entertainment. Right, because we're not just a dry, you know. And today we're going to talk about the Oban Distillers Edition. You know, you got it's got to be some sort of entertainment edition there. So I appreciate all my fellow whiskey tubers. I benefit from them. I enjoy them, but I, I greatly appreciate it. And I kind of wonder what, imagine if I didn't get into wine. Imagine if I never got into wine and I started off with whiskey or I started with beer. How different would my journey be in my perceptions and the way I interpret and understand whiskey be if I didn't have that background? I'm really, really glad I had the wine, the, had the wine background. Um, but I think if you were a beer person, you'd probably bring in something different. Uh, and to how how you perceive and understand whiskeys, right? Because um, uh, whiskey is a distilled uh, beer. But I, th I think it really, really helps me a lot. I think the biggest thing that I think I benefit from is the time I spent with master distillers and masters of wine. Um, so I had mentors in the, in the Institute of Masters of Wine. In fact, I was supposed to be going on to the route to become a master of wine. Uh, in, in pursuing the WSET diploma, Wines for Education West diploma. My next step was supposed to go off and do, uh, prepare for become a master of wine. Did some work for the Institute of Masters of Wine. Is the, it's almost a scientific approach in, in analysis or the way in which a law enforcement background, um, the way you approach data and information and analyze it and bring it together, it's somewhat a little bit more like that. And so, um, but also be, just to be in, and to be in the habit of retro engineering things. I think that's probably the best thing is the training I had with master sommeliers and what they imparted me and masters of wine um, and the analytical skills. But it but it hasn't been a simple cut and paste. It's not like I just go boom, okay, do what they do here and then do it over here. For the first six months to a year, I would say, um, and all my old videos are gone. I've deleted them. Um, the video quality wasn't that good, and frankly, a lot of things I, you know, I, I don't like the videos, so I deleted them. If someone tuned into one of those videos, I, they make these negative comments. I'm like, dude, this is an early video. It was early in my journey, dude. This is an early video. It was in my, you know, you got to keep explaining yourself as to why the video isn't all that great. Well, so I did a script. I just deleted. I just, just deleted. You know, I still have one video up there, which I'm, which would eventually will be deleted. Uh, that, that I, I keep people keep making like months going to complaints about anyway i think it's more of the discipline that's what i'm looking for it's more of the deductive discipline that i learned and approaching what wines and then i just had to kind of figure out okay it's not the same thing um different emphasis different things 
and, and how you approach it. And I think that's been the, 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 the main thing. But that's also something I want to share uh, with the whiskey community is what I learned from them and pass it on so more people pick up on for it. So I, I missed a comment up there. Um, I don't know. Like, uh, <laughs> Dustin says, I'd have beef or pizza with Eric Waite today as a Christopher Malloy. I must have missed something in the conversation. I don't understand beef. Oh, you're talking about whiskey pairing? A whiskey pairing? Was that it? Okay, I'm trying, I don't know. Beef or pizza came in there. Um, Dustin says, I'd call, I like to call it a nuance. Right. The, the P is more of a nuance. What is everyone drinking? No, 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 I'm going to take. Um, what other? I'm trying to catch all the comments here. Any whiskey tubers you have a beef with? Oh, okay. Uh, any whiskey tubers you have a beef with? You mean you have disagreements over personal disagreements rather than just. Um, every community I've ever been a part of, there's always, because it's, it's got people in it. Whether you're talking about when I was in the Marine Corps, various agencies I've worked for, workplaces I've been into, churches I've been to. In the, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about, in the church, the best people I've ever met, I've met in the church. And the worst people I've ever met have been in the church. In the whiskey world, the best people I've ever met, I've met in the whiskey world. I won't say worst. That would be that would be exaggeration. But there's been people where you rub personalities, rub each other. You know what I mean? It's like, so, yeah, there's been those incidents there. But I, I focus on the positive, forget the negative, and move on. Just realize, hey, no matter where you go, there's always going to be someone there that you're going to, they're going to rub you the wrong way. You're going to rub them the wrong way. Sometimes it's due to a lack of communication. Sometimes it's ego. Oh my goodness. Sometimes it's ego, particularly when I went, when I went to seminary, when more educated people get, the more opinionated they get and the more egotistical they get. You know what I mean? Um, and so sometimes there's some of that involved. Sometimes people read you the wrong way and they characterize you and they're stuck with this sort of characterization of you and you don't feel like you're being actually representative and so they say stuff and you're like you know what don't focus on it move on i just realize realize i it's like ex-girlfriends or whatever i don't keep harp on old ex-girlfriends or breakups or whatever just move on so same thing with that all right whiskey teaches you a lot right and you've heard me say this a million times never judge a whiskey by neck pour because first impressions you know, it may change as you get past the shoulder. Same thing with people. As you get to know people, uh, I would say most of my whiskey experiences, I was less impressed from the neck pour, more impressed as I moved in. I've I've not had a whiskey that I liked up front and then it went bad. I'm not saying it doesn't. I think I heard Rob whiskey in the six say that one time. He had a whiskey that started off great and then went south. I've not had that experience. I've had just sort of the opposite. They tend to improve as you get into it. But I think people that way. There are some people when you first meet them. You're like, I don't, man, I don't know about this dude. Straight up, straight up. And this is no secret. Daniel and Rex over at the, the Whiskey Vault, right? I was highly, I'm, the, uh, uh, the jury's still out on Rex. Rex's dad, awesome dude, Roy Williams. Rex, I got to keep an eye on that guy. That's, I'm, and I'm joking, all right? Love those guys. Love those guys. You know, but I, I'll be honest, I was like highly skeptical of those guys. I was like, eh, I don't know. Man, they were they're t more goofball than I am and a different kind of goofball. They're more of a Texas goofball. And you know, you know, you know what I mean? And they rose so fast, it made me skeptical. And then and then obviously, if I may state the case, um, you know, Daniel's got this big ass coin hanging around his neck. And I now have one of those coins. Um, uh, in fact, it's sitting over here. Uh I there's no way in the hell I'm gonna work go around wearing this thing. You know. You see Daniel wearing this big ass thing around his neck. I, was, uh, I will never, ever, ever. If you ever, if you ever see me out in public walking around with this thing in my head, you have my permission to kick me in the ass. Okay, so I've got one of these freaking hella, yeah, yeah, uh, hella, hella heavy. It's insane to wear this thing. I was, you, you know, you can't help but go what. But that's the point. That's the point. They're making a statement about snobbery, about whiskey snobbery. 
you make it ridiculous so that if you can still act like a snob with one of these things around your neck, uh, then there's something seriously wrong with you. And that, and then you go, ah, oh, that's genius. Then you realize it's stupid. It's ridiculous on purpose. That's the point of it. That's freaking genius. And that's freaking genius, right? I love that. All right. It's painful to wear around, around your neck. There's, there's no way I'm going to wear one of those things. All right. All right. So the uh, other people rub your own way. Sometimes it's temporary. Sometimes you're friends and you still remain friends with them. You still remain friends with them, right? You know, um, maybe you have a little bit of a clash, but you don't let it break up your friendship. You still hang out with them. You know, you disagreed about this or that, and but you still hang out with them. You still have friends with them. You don't let that break up a friendship. But that's whiskey. That's whiskey. I'm gonna take another sip. Um. By the way, I'm only drinking this whiskey for medicinal purposes. But actually, you don't want to combine painkillers with this. Let me ask you a question. Answer yes or no. Have you ever, is there a distillery? Can you think of a distillery in which you like most of what they produce, but there's this one particular bottle you're just like, but you don't like it? Like, what the hell? Why do they do that? And it's kind of like, eh? yes or no? Let me know in the chat. Yes. And let me know what it is. Is there a distillery out there? that they have one particular bottling that you don't like, but you like everything else they do or most of what they do. If you can think of a distillery, and, and if you watch this on a replay, let me know down below. Is there a distillery where you generally like most of what they got, but there's some of the whiskeys, it's like, what the hell? Mike Bennett says, uh, Camp Single Malt Review, and Eric Wade, of course. Um, the Froig Select, uh, Davis style. Michael Hassler, only um yeah, my costume says I don't watch whiskey. But I watch all their videos, but they're a little bourbon heavy. I'm not as much of a bourbon fan. Um, Rafi's the 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 bee's knees. I like Rafi. Anoch 2007 was so disappointing. Scotch down under. Cameron Youngson says Lafroig Select. Oh, because now it's Lafroig Select. Uh, Dustin says not so extreme, but I love Springbank and the Green Box Springbank 18 is jarringly off. Right. Um, Thanks for the tip. Everybody take notes. Chris McClure, thank you for tuning in. I was going to say Lafroig Select, too. So more than one person says that. Uh, mezcal is great to my palate, and this is the only mezcal finish I know. Uh, oh, he's talking to somebody else. Uh, Beth Haggins, uh, Higgins, Higgins, sorry. Beth Higgins says, uh, I hate Basil Haydens. Basil Haydens, uh, which is, um, that is Jim Beam, right? Basil Hayden is Jim Beam. I, I, if I were, let me know if I'm correct. So I've been to the distillery and I remember of all the lineup that I tried there, Basil Hayden's didn't ring my bell. Yeah. Ardbeg and Noah is, is no good for me. And I love Ardbeg. Jack White. I like, it's not my favorite of the lineup. Um, but I like the, I like the Anno. That's the Pedro Jimenez cask. See? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jim Beam. So people, uh, there's so many great, metaphors and images from whiskey that will teach you something about people. So just as I don't write off a distillery because they have one expression that I'm not a big fan of or rubs me in the wrong way or didn't particularly like, it's the same thing with people, right? You know, some people, they're your friends, and yet there's this, maybe this is one part of them or there's one particular event or occasion that you weren't particularly thrilled with, Right. I do this with myself. I have, so I have books and I write, I interact with my books by writing in the margins and underlining and scribbling. I have books in which I wrote, you know, years and years ago, I wrote something in it, you know, and my sort of a negative comment on the author of the book. Then years later, I go back, I reread the book and I read my comments and I've thought about it some more. And then I write more comments with a different color ink. And the second time I'm writing, I'm disagreeing with my previous comments, 
right? So I'm disagreeing with myself and what I wrote in that book, right? This is the nature of personalities and per, per, and people and whiskeys that you can sort of disagree with yourself for, for, for a moment in time. And yet still, you know what, give, here's, here's one thing I wish, one of the things from the, from the whis whiskey vault guys that I really appreciate. They have several stand, basic standards. Hey, drink whiskey however you like. You don't judge people for what they like to drink and how they like to drink it, right? But the third thing that they emphasize is um, give people the benefit of the doubt. Give people the benefit of the doubt, right? If they said something, don't mentally write them off or judge them or jump on them because of what they said. If more people did that, right, give people the benefit of the doubt. Try to put people in the best light. You know, some people have a bad day, right? Try hanging out with me in the morning before I've had a cup of coffee, and I am a beep boop asshole, right? I am. I, I'm just like, because before I have my cup of coffee and I've kind of, you know, I've got my buzz on, I'm like, eh, eh, and my brain's kind of foggy and I'm kind of, eh, okay? Uh, if, if you're in pain, if, if something's going wrong, right? You know, you just, it's a bad day at work and you come home and you're like, you just want to kick the cat or something, you know? Then you have a whiskey, sit down from the television, and kind of chill and relax, and then all is right with the world. Realize that some people on that particular moment, you may be encountering them, they're just at that moment you interact with them are having a bad time. Uh, James Morgan says, sorry, my man, I like my parents' sayings. I'm not sure I understand that. Um, so, you kind of try, now I've had people in the whiskey community who didn't do that with me, um, and I have tried to reach out to them. I've invited them to come on. We can discuss issues, and they're stuck in their little thing, and she so just go move on, whatever, whatever. So, all right, kind of man, I kind of went on a long talk about that and whiskeys but i'm talking about whiskeys too right some whiskeys maybe they didn't rub me the right the same uh the fr first time around i had people comment there was a particular whiskey they didn't like it and they said they're going to pour it down the drain i'm like no 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 don't pour it down the drain right just put the cap back in put it on a shelf and come back in six months right it maybe it'll change maybe you will change Sometimes the whiskey changes. Sometimes we change in our interaction perception, or sometimes both change. I changed and the whiskey changed, right? And then you come back to it. Maybe it's gotten better. Pete Week, uh, Christopher Malloy. Yeah, there's an example. Um, you know, he's, he's, so you give the whiskey benefit. You've already spent the money, right? Unless it's flawed, like unless it has a technical flaw. And that's probably one of the, I, I've been doing these little short videos on technical flaws, uh, like, Trichlorinacil, cork taint, stuff like that, and that's a challenging. What is a matter? What is a technical flaw? There's something technically wrong with the whiskey. You know, they went too deep into the into the faints. That's an overly fainty whiskey, or it was a bad cask, bad cork, or something like that, or it's overly oxidized. The distinguish between what you personally do and do not like versus what is an actual flaw. Uh, a lot of this happens in the wine world. So in um, at Burgundy, right? Bourgogne uh, in, in, in France. Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So one of the, I think it's kind of gone away. There was a particular characteristic of a lot of Burgundy red wines, Pinot Noir, that was very, very different than Pinot Noir from California, New Zealand, Oregon, or else. And it was this weird funk. Uh, it might remind you a little bit of Campbellton. And it was from a, a yeast, a native yeast called um, uh, Brettomyces. They call it Brett for short, B-R-E-T-T, -T, Brettomyces. And if you were to Google Brettomyces, it'll actually describe it as a spoilage yeast. So uh, um, some wines in Burgundy would get a little bit of natural Brettomyces, right? And it would give this weird slight funk to the wine some people like in very small amounts some people liked brett they liked a little bit of bretomyces it gave it that weird earthy character to it right 
Of course, the French, you know, they got to defend the wine. Oh, it's terroir. It's terroir. It's terroir. So when I was, I was studying winemaking, and, and when I went back to college to study winemaking, and, you know, because we're Californians, right? And you don't run into Brett, typically, in California wines. It's not that it can't be there. It's just that they eliminate him. And guys would rip on French. Oh, they think it's terroir. It's just freaking Brett, right? It's just freaking Brett. Brett of Myces. And it's his character. <coughs> well, eventually, more and more, people began to see Brett of Myces is not an expression of terroir. It's a spoilage. It's a spoilage yeast. It's a technical flaw. Get rid of it. Uh, there's a, nothing in Riesling. It's like a gasoline. I may have heard me mention this before uh, with the um, Connemara. Some Rieslings in Germany, it's um, trimethyldihydronaphthalene. It's like a plastic gasoline. No, you can get, get just like a spot of it. Some people find, oh, it's just a little kerosene, not just a little slight kerosene. I had it from um, Rieslings from Washington State as well. You know, just a little bit of there. People go, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, no, 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 no. Now the professionals and the official articles and the scholarly articles on wine say, nope, that's a flaw. You don't want that in your wine. Don't make your wines that way. And now that we have uh, global warming and warmer days and more sunshine, um, that character is sort of going away with German, German Rieslings. It's becoming uh, less, less common. But it's funny. What people at one time thought gave a wine a little bit of something different and interesting, they're now calling a flaw. The challenge, it's not that necessarily, Christopher Molloy, it's not that necessarily it would be 100% undrinkable. In extremes, it would be undrinkable. It would be just like, ugh, you know? It's just that some people think just a little bit of uh, something a little off. Interesting. If I may use an analogy, this may sound sexist. I don't mean to sound this way. You know, uh, Marilyn Monroe, she had like a mole. I don't know if it was real or not, you know? Or you see a woman who, who beautiful woman, but they have maybe a, their nose is a little bit big. And I think it's really, really sad when a woman or a young woman wants to have a nose job because they think their nose is too big. No, 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 It's those little nuance of, you know, that little mole or maybe the nose is a little bit of a bump right there. That's what we, what makes you, makes you attractive because it means you're obtainable. If you were too perfect, then you're a threat because you're unobtainable. And so we don't, we like that little, just a little bit of a flaw. You know, we find that more attractive. Sometimes it's like, <laughs> sometimes it's like that with whiskeys, uh, you know, just a little funkiness, you know, Campbellton, right? Um, if you read the history of Campbellton, I know they talk about the Campbellton funk, but they were producing whiskey so fast and such mass production that man, it was more than just some Campbellton funk. They were producing very fainty whiskeys and it ruined the reputation of Campbellton, which is one of the reasons, among others, why they went from like 31, 32 distilleries down to three, right? Um, so a little bit of Brett, some people found interesting. And that doesn't mean that you say you're gonna eliminate it 100%. Because if people find it interesting and they like that a little bit of character, then you still make your wines that way. So the, one of the challenges in learning about whiskeys is, um, is this a flaw or is it just something I don't particularly like? I don't particularly like. And this is gets people say it's it, you know well it's something's purely su subjective or whatever like right? right now what you like is what you like and what you like it, and, and, you know even if it's tastes like you know like like dog crap you know if you like eating dog crap you know it, more power to you but and the general consensus is that this particular whiskey or this particular wine it, it, that that characteristic is a flaw and that's not something uh, generally desirable in a wine or a whiskey is like yeah. Same thing with people, same thing with music. You know, how many musical bands can you think of where technically the lead vocalist uh, is not a good singer, right? Uh, here's a cute Led Zeppelin, right? Right? I, I know some, I'm gonna, someone's going to be offended. Led Zeppelin, right? Probably one of the all time best bands, you know, great songs and all this kind of stuff. But technically, from a technical perspective, 
Robert Plant is not a great he's not a great singer, right? He's, he's just not. But it fits with the music. Johnny Cash, love Johnny Cash. Uh, Nirvana, right, right, right. Cameron, yeah, Nirvana, exactly, right. These aren't technically trained great singers. Johnny Cash, right? But Johnny Cash's voice gives the music character and a particular style, so that Johnny Cash is in a class of his own. And it's that the, the roughness sort of backs up the storytelling. Johnny Cash is a storyteller, right? His music have a story behind it. Where right? you talking about, um, you know, um, 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 Ring of Fire or any of the other songs? He's a storyteller, and the sort of the roughness, and of course he's the Man in Black, with the voice sort of fits. Um, Tom Waits, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, it kind of fits uh, with, with the music. All right. So you can have something in a whiskey that gives it a roughness. Um, it isn't finely polished, right? It's not smooth, but that's what you like about it. I think one example of that um, right here, Ardbeg Supernova. Uh, great whiskey, fantastic whiskey, but it catches me. It's, I mean, it's over the top. It catches me in the throat a little bit rough, a little bit rough on the back. I like, so I like to blend this with uh, uh, Corey Vrecken. Blend this with 50 50 Corey Vrecken and uh, Ardbeg Supernova. And for me, that really balances them out really, really, really well. All right. Da -da -da -da. So, um, Oban, keep this one falling over. Oban, I like the distillery. I like the whiskeys. I've never had anything bad from there. Um, I think it's a good entry to smoke and peat. I think this is fairly well balanced. Quality price ratio is debatable. Um, but they think they have a different distinctive character. That gives you know, like a bigger profile of Diageo. It fills a good niche, a good spot on the shelf for, for Diageo. That in terms of styles and, and, and profiles of whiskeys, it has its own distinctive character and that Oban character, just like Talisker. It has that distinctive character that that's, uh, you could go head to head with other painted whiskeys, but it kind of stands, uh, kind of stands uh, on its own. So, all righty. So I've been at this for an hour and seven minutes. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. So um, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. If you're watching on the replay, I know we're having a good time, uh, but I like to keep this down to about an hour, and it's getting towards uh, dinner time. So every Friday, 5 p.m., uh, 5 p.m., I uh, want to go live. We'll be back here next Friday. By the way, I'm approaching 10,000 subscribers. I might be there next. I might hit 10,000 before next Friday. Don't know. We'll see how it goes. Approaching there quickly. If so, going to come up with something special. Tr try to come up with uh, something special. I want to thank everyone who is tuned in for uh, the live stream. I want to thank everyone who's watching on, on the replay. And if you have any comments, if you have any questions, uh, I'll leave them down below. Again, Dustin, uh, my moderator, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And uh, let's go out with a little bit of uh, rock and roll.